So welcome everybody. I'm Christina Dolan and I'm the chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum. And we're really excited to uh, be here this evening. I um, want to thank uh, Ann Shin and Chris Noble. And uh, I specifically want to uh, thank Pete and Dan, where are you? Uh, raise your hands. You did an amazing job. I mean, this event has sold out. There were 35 people on the wait list. So thank you so much for doing such an amazing uh, job organizing this event. Um, the MIT Enterprise Forum has a number of other events that you may be interested in. We have a uh, uh, cybersecurity event coming on uh, November 7th and in a blockchain event on November 16th. And on December 1st, there's a VR event. So we hope to see many of you at the, those future events. Um, so to get started with the evening, I would like to thank uh, Anshin. And where is Chris? I'd love to have him come up and just say a few words. Why don't you come up here? Thank you so much for hosting this event. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Noble. I'm a partner at Anshin. I'm also co-chair of the Software and Technology Industry Group. Happy to have everybody here, happy to host MIT's FinTech event this evening. We have a great turnout. Even with this beautiful New York City weather, everybody still made it. Um, Anshin is a 350 person accounting firm with specialties in various industries. We work primarily with privately held companies, growth stage, startups, um, uh, and you know, well-established companies. We're more than an accounting firm in the fact that you know we do tax work, we do audit work, uh, we do financial statements. But you know we, we also consider ourselves uh, you know a right hand man to our clients, almost like an outsourced CFO. So we help them with things like um, you know tax credits and incentives, R and D credits, especially software companies, uh, international tax matters, especially the way. Uh, you know the industry is nowadays. Most companies do have you know international tax uh, matters and planning at the early stages. You know for their exit strategies. So my team is uh, here today in the back, standing. You can give a little wave. If you want to learn more about what we do, we'd be more than happy to meet you. We'll be here throughout the evening. And uh, thank you, MIT, and thanks for everyone for coming. Enjoy. Thank you. Well, let's get started. Thank you so much, Chris and, and Anshin. And um, so let's get started. OK, thank you very much. So my name is Miklos Dietz. I am one of the senior partners of McKinsey, another consulting firm. Uh, I am leading something in McKinsey called Global Banking Strategy and also a global fintech team. This basically means that I'm one of the crazier guys in McKinsey who try to do the 10-year forward-looking strategic thinking. And my job today is to give a bit of an intro. I would like to share, and I got 10 minutes, so I have to be super concentrated. I, uh, I, have, I would like to share a bit with you as an intro some of our thinking about where the world is going. And because I'm the global guy and the long-term guy, I have to apologize, but I start from far away, kind of in the future. So we in McKinsey do believe something well known, right? Banking is transforming. But what we are also believing that it is not actually transforming it in itself. The whole digital universe, a relatively large part of the economy, everything which is about providing services to individuals and businesses is transforming. From telcos to utilities, industry barriers are blurring and increasingly what we are seeing is that instead of hundreds and thousands of apps the world is going towards the universe of a few gateways providing services digital services integrated into everyday life everywhere it happens at a different speed in different parts of the world it happens very fast in china when there's a lot of leapfrogging it happens much slower in some other markets and the u.s is obviously it's on its own path but we clearly see the whole world is transforming. That means the way customers are getting services, any type of services, are transforming. <coughs> that means that in this universe, banking needs to reinvent, financial services in general need to reinvent what they are doing. Almost everything about financial services is about data, ones and zeros. The way we provide ones and zeros are vastly changing if anyone 
have seen blockbusters recently <laughs> versus Netflix, you see that uh, the provision of digital services is a business which tend to disrupt. Banking in the next 10, 15 years will change more than it has changed in the last 100 years. And of course, it doesn't mean that it will disappear, the sky is falling down. What it does mean though is that there will be radical business model changes. Uh, now, these radical business model changes are increasingly happening via fintech. Fintech is a natural phenomenon. If you see a big industry transforming, you see new companies coming up and creating innovation. If you see a really big industry transforming, and banking is the single biggest industry in the planet with a $1.3 trillion profit pool, you see a lot of companies emerging. Fintechs in some way are the natural, uh, <coughs> let's say, enablers of this tremendous transformation banking is experiencing. We see fintech, we, have see, we see fintech entering into its second era, fintech 2.0 to sound cool, although I never actually managed to sound cool, but I try. Uh, fintech, this new era of fintech is broader, more diversified, trickier, right? We have seen the first hype era, kind of a bit passing. We have seen large peer-to-peer -peer players, payment players going down, but we are also seeing new startups emerging. We are increasingly seeing that this new, more mature, faster growing uh, fintech era is giving a tool for the broader sector to reinvent itself. And we are also seeing this increasingly become global and widespread. This universe, and apologies, this is a very detailed chart, with, even if we are trying to really summarize what is happening in fintech, we have to break it up to around at least 30 different groups. Fintech is not one thing. There are many, many vastly different uh, areas of innovation. Many, many companies within that who are going after niches, reinventing businesses. But a relatively large part of them is in the middle, which is a bit the focus for today's discussion, which is around investing, the next generation of investing. The world has around $190 <coughs> trillion dollars worth of wealth, which is currently managed in an exceedingly old-fashioned way, right? It's, it's a bit like, you know, I don't want to, I don't have enough time to tell you some of the stories, but basically there are 87-year-old women now who basically say nothing has changed since she was 17. It's a great story. This is clearly changing, right? People want to have different type of services. Understanding how this 190 trillion, and the US in itself is more than a quarter of this wealth, right? How this vast, enormous amount of money is being provided services. These are one of the most interesting topics and areas for uh, fintechs. And fintechs are offering new solutions <coughs> all over the front, all, at all fronts here. We have seen globalist platforms, all the robots coming up and uh, providing services. Some, for some reason, nobody have thought about for 50 years, even though it's not that hard. Access to far more complex products, the democratization of finance, uh, community services, social network increasingly being used. Uh, eToro is a great example of how people are kind of learning from each other, how increasingly the whole story is not about the bank giving advice, but advice getting connected like a kind of web 2.0 user generated contract. Offering broader services, aggregating data, using online for advice. We are seeing how this 190 trillion game is shaping and changing very, very quickly. Now, it takes a lot of time, right? This is a tr old traditional business and any assumption that somehow in two or three years it will change is wrong. I mean, we have just in the US, I mentioned, we have around $26 trillion still managed by traditional wealth managers and all the total wealth managed by, uh, ma managed by all the attackers is a paltry 3% of that. So this is certainly a long story. But importantly, the way fintechs are achieving impact is not necessary by replacing traditional players. It's increasingly more by partnering with them. 
In the first era of fintech, we have seen the story, the, everybody was the next Uber. We will Uberize bank. I'm, I'm sure you all heard that, um, especially if you are in the investment size. You, have, you, you probably deserve a penny for at least when every next Uber type of company. People wanted to reinvent finance, but finance is a vastly complex. It's not one business, it's dozens. It's hard to Uberize something which is so vastly complex. And what we are seeing is that the pendulum is shifting towards next generation fintechs increasingly looking to partner. The concept is almost like the financial sector needs to transform. It requires it to, to rewrite its very genes. That's not an easy exercise. So let's outsource innovation to new startups who are coming up with the ideas. Let's connect in, partner in, buy in, attract these startups. And by this, let's enable a slow moving tra uh, sector to sl still uh, transfer, transform quickly and rapidly. We see how large financial players are getting very smart in partnering with fintechs. They are maintaining open APIs, hundreds of partners selecting continuously, bringing in the good ideas. We, it's a long process, but it is the largest industry in the planet going through its largest transformation ever and even getting the little niches and the little cortex corners here. We are speaking about the vast opportunity of value creation. We don't see fintechs uberizing banking anytime soon, but we see them creating tremendous investment and value opportunity by coming up with ideas which can get scaled to the level of trillions. And again, in this scale, even little ideas go a long way. Of course, this means lots of innovation, but it also means lots of humility and care. If we are looking at this enormous amount of money, this pie, it's very, very important to not, not to forget that the next generation of investing doesn't necessarily mean investing for millennials. Millennials are awesome, and I'm jealous of them because they are younger and cooler than me. But, <laughs> but, and they have an advantage on pretty much every front, except when it comes to wealth. <laughs> ha. I have to record something for me, right? Uh, if you look at total wealth distribution of North America, all the current millennials, like currently defined as younger than 35, mm -hmm. many people in the first, fro first few rows apparently are in this group, you guys have 2% of the total wealth. <laughs> Even in 10 years' time, that will only go up to 10. The real story is innovating and reinventing this one. The real story is finding the magical solutions for the 50, 60 year old. And by the way, this 10% is already enormous trillions, right? So getting solution right for millennials is not a bad idea. But the holy grail is, and this is something which the industry has not yet found, but I think today the panel will have an opportunity to take closer, is to go to this hub to find the solutions for those tens of trillions. People who are older than 60, they are not anti-technology. They are the best customers in the world. If they choose digital, they choose digital for comfort. Not, they are not fickle like millennials. They are not necessarily that price conscious. They can be the most valuable customers. It's very important that such business models are being found to serve them, not just very young people. But whether you aim young or old, whether you are going after reinventing the players or cooperating with partners, I think the overall story and the closing of this intro is this is an enormous economic transformation. Finding there will be hundreds and hundreds of new business models. Finding the right new business models can actually move the needle and can create a value creation opportunity at, very, at a historical scale. So I think this should give a, it should make today's session quite interesting and quite relevant. And I'm looking forward to seeing the many ideas here. here. Great, thanks for that. So um, we're going to start with some introductions of our panel. Um, so I'll give you just a minute to introduce yourself, starting with uh, Sunny Furry. Yeah, you can you can use that microphone right there. 
Is that on? Yeah. Why don't they come up and? Hi. Uh, yeah. Sure, you, you can come up and we got, we got time. Come on up. <laughs> come on down. Yeah, so th this will work if you want to jump in there. We can pass this. Let's take us. Thank you for it. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll keep it brief. My name is Sonny Parikh. I work for the Partnership Fund for New York City. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the Partnership Fund, we're, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. We're part of the Partnership for New York City, which is a members only organization representing the CEOs of the top 300 companies in New York on um, business interests in New York City, and the goal being to work together to catalyze uh, growth and economic activity in New York. Uh, and the fund itself is funded, um, we've invested 135 million to date uh, with the goal of increasing economic activity in New York, creating jobs. So we've invested in things like City Bike, Brooklyn Brewery, um, things like Copyright Kitchen. But we're also uh, investing in innovation and technology that helps New York City grow as a tech center. So that's my area of focus. I focus on FinTech and digital health. And um, in, in FinTech, uh, we focus, uh, we invest in companies, typically seed Series A, but uh, we also run this uh, program called the FinTech Innovation Lab, which the, the goal of the lab is to bring together, uh, as you so clearly defined, uh, bring together the startup ecosystem to work with the large financial institutions. So we have 30 plus financial institutions uh, as part of our partnership. Um, and we work together every year. We had we take about six to eight companies every year that focus on uh, addressing challenges that large financial institutions have. So companies like CB Insights, Enigma, Digital Asset have been part of our program. Um, after graduation, they've raised over um, 300 million to date. We've had 39 companies go through. So if you're a company um, that's looking at addressing a challenge that large financial institutions have, um, we're actually also opening applications to our lab uh, October 24th. Find me after, or go to fintech innovation lab at mic.com. Um, happy to chat afterwards too. So thanks. Hi everyone. I'm Charles Burnham from Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, we're a large uh, global early stage venture capital firm. Uh, I'm based here in New York, um, and I focus on financial services to some other sectors as well. That I would call that my major um, for the firm. Uh, we are sector focused and stage agnostic. We invest out of a $1.6 billion fund currently. It's our ninth fund. Uh, and what we do limit ourselves on is trying to have a thesis on a given space uh, and be somewhat proactive in where we make investments. We might start with uh, as early as a $200,000 or $1 million investment in a team we've worked with in the past, um, but we'll write $40, $50 million checks for growth stage businesses, some of which we've been in for many years. Um, so it's a pretty unique model in that sense. Um, I've been with the firm for about three and a half years, involved with our fintech companies like Betterment, um, Bread, Zopa, Quantopian, Abacus, um, several others. We have a pretty rich history in the area. Um, I think one thing that's pretty unique about this asset class, which makes it a really good fit for a fund like ours that's been around for a long time and has a pretty stable capital base, is I think you made a great point. These things do not happen overnight. Um, and we are not afraid of regulated industries where large change is necessary, but it's not going to happen in three to five years, like some venture areas. Um, we're comfortable with that. We invest in healthcare, we invest in education, we invest in uh, right now space. <laughs> we have a few satellite companies in the portfolio. So there are things that we're comfortable doing that we're, where we're going to be in for seven or ten years, long before an exit is even considered. Um, it's not what we try and focus on all the time, but uh, we're comfortable with that. So I think we tend to be a good fit for entrepreneurs. We can be long-term partners. We first invested in Betterment back in 2010 when I believe one of my colleagues was probably a third of their AUM. Uh, and, and now you know the company is really hitting its stride, but we've been in it for, for five or six years already. And I think that's uh, what we fully expect uh, when we do a lot of these financial services deals. Currently, um, we're pretty focused on a few areas that we don't have a ton of exposure. I think the residential mortgage opportunity uh, has yet to be disrupted. Uh, I think we're pretty amazed at how little has changed since the crisis, um, and we're exploring a lot of new models there. Um, insurance, we're not alone in that, but uh, a lot of great entrepreneurs are now kind of focusing their attention on, on the insurance area. Um, we haven't made a ton of bets there. We've been a little bit uninspired by what's come, but I think a lot of interesting, thing, interesting things are in the works. Um, so those are two areas we're really focused on, and uh, the blockchain is something we've been tracking for a long time. I don't think um, we've, we've felt the timing has been right thus far, but uh, I think a lot of interesting things are, are to come. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview.
My name is Tom Ryan. I'm a partner at Anthemus Group. Uh, we're a uh, fintech-only uh, VC and advisory firm. Uh, we were founded in 2010, the same year we also invested in Betterment. Um, uh, so we think about this space it, a lot in the, in the same way that you presented it, um, it, it, which is that this is a, we're, we're at the very beginning of a multi-decade phenomenon of transformation and evolution of financial services. Most of the financial services and products that we know and use on a day-to-day -day basis are really, we're really born in the industrial age, uh, and, and we think, you know, we're just at the very beginnings of the digital age or the information age where, uh, you know, transparency and, and customer centricity and, and easy access uh, are, are going to be more of the norm than they have been in the past. So, so we think, um, you know, we're very patient in the way that we think about the world and this transformation. Um, we've made... 37 investments to date. Our, our sweet spot is early stage, uh, so we primarily invest in, in seed and A. So, as I said, Betterment's a portfolio company. Uh, Simple Bank, uh, which is one of the first uh, challenger banks in the US, is, uh, was a portfolio company. They're one of our first exits. Um, uh, we also invested really early in a company called Climate Corporation, uh, which provided uh, weather insurance for farmers and, and other related insurance underwriters, and that was bought by Monsanto in uh, 2012. So, so we think really broadly about financial services and, and maybe creatively. Uh, again, um, you know, as you said, also I think we see a lot of what we've seen over the last you know eight years or so, and we've looked at about 4,000 companies since we were founded, but. You know, we're still in the very early stage. There's a lot of, um, you know, we sort of joke that there's a lot of perfume on a pig. There's a lot of <laughs> apps and, and functionality and business models that are really, you know, sort of elegant UIs and UXs on otherwise broken and and, and not interesting uh, back ends and middle ends. So Betterment's a good example of, a, of original business model that we like, and, and there's others that that I can uh, that I can mention. But that's what we do. We have offices in New York, London, and Geneva. Uh, purposely don't have an office in the Valley. I think there's a lot of hubris there, and so we try to keep ourselves out of that part of the world. No offense to any uh, In fact, our chief investment officer, uh, who, who uh, Darren would know, uh, sits on, on the mountain in Geneva um, uh, and comes down off the mountain and takes meetings and goes to board meetings at Betterment, etc. But um, we try to keep ourselves out of the fray and thinking big about the opportunity. Uh, that's me, and look forward to talking more to me later. Hi everybody, um, I have not invested in Betterment, I'm maybe the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have a Betterment account, so I guess that's okay. Thank you. Um, it's more important. Um, my name is Adi Lebanon. Um, I have invested over the past, uh, over a year now, in early stage um, fintech businesses spread across six main categories. Um, one of them obviously is what we're talking tonight, which is wealth and asset management, but also invested in capital markets, uh, banking, lending, payments. Um, blockchain space as well. I've been a fan of that for years when it was more just a Bitcoin conversation. <clears throat> and also look a lot heavily into insurance um, as well. Um, I think that's it for now. I'm happy to meet uh, any one of the companies here. I've met, actually I think everybody on the panel this evening. It's great to meet you guys and see you guys again, sorry. Um, that's it, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm not an investor. Um, but these guys pay my salary, so thank you. Uh, so my name is Dustin Lucian. Uh, I work at Betterment. Um, I'm the COO. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of, about Betterment, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself so you can have a little context on background. Um, so uh, actually, I'll start with myself. So I joined with Betterment about four years ago. There were about 22 people in the company and about five people on the engineering team, and I joined as the VP of engineering. Um, we've got roughly 200 or so people in the company now. So we've been growing at quite a clip. Uh, a little bit more about Betterment. Charles uh, shared that we were founded or launched in 2010, actually founded a little bit earlier than that. Uh, one TechCrunch disrupt uh, that year uh, and kind of been taking off since then. Uh, at this point we have, and I forgot to refresh my numbers before I left, so these will be a little bit conservative. Uh, we have uh, roughly 150,000 customers on the platform and uh, just north of 5.9 billion in assets under management. So growth has been great. Um, and if there, I'd just like to ask, uh, are there any other Betterment customers in the audience? All right, cool. Thank you all very much for being Betterment customers. Um, so, anyway, back to myself and, and what I do at the company. 
Uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, making sure that the trains run on time. Um, so I think about product design and engineering. I think about our customer experience team. Uh, and I think a lot about efficiency of delivering product, which for us is our user experience as well as the underlying trading infrastructure and architecture. Um, so uh, I'll try to bring a little bit of the internal lens of how do you build a technology first financial service uh, in this day and age. And we're not just for millennials, if anybody else is wondering. Uh, we have plenty of tools and, uh, and capabilities uh, focused on pre-retirees, retirees, uh, and all, all different demographics. So that's it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I am Jane Barrett. I'm the founder and CEO of Goldbeam. Uh, my chief technology officer, Asani Oakley, is here. Um, our business and our goal is to get more people invested. And kudos to Dr. Deeds, you have great data. But this is why investing is kind of so messed up, because everyone's chasing the pile. And isn't it hilarious that millennials only have 10% of the market? So having a goal to get more people into the market in a very pop culture friendly way is what we do. So we have personalized advice. We are a registered investment advisor. We technically are a mobile advisor. Um, but we have a very different way to go to market. We do have a B2C platform at hellogoldbean.com. But our primary business is actually white labeling our content and our software to banks and brokers. So the three pillars of our business, we say we're an education first advisor and we are absolutely hand on heart. We make no assumptions. Again, people who have a pile of money to invest, you have a ton of options. Go knock yourself out. People who maybe didn't grow up in a family where you know, money was talked about, or there was maybe bad financial habits at home, they really have to start from a place of, wait, what the hell is a fund? What's a stock? Why should I do this? What is a risk? So we have placed a lot, of, um, a lot of focus on education, and that's how we lead people into their investment journey. Um, we have a very unique advisory platform, in the, and we are swimming against the passive investing trend. We recommend portfolios that have a base of ETFs, depending on the risk, but we also recommend individual equities, which usually brings out a Victorian gasp in room like this <laughs> um, Having, But see, for the people that we're talking to, when you say index fund, mutual fund, ETF, they shut down. If you say Nike and Under Armour, and do you spend a lot of money at Walmart, but you can have a different conversation. And this is the world that I came from and Hassani came from. We've worked with big banks, we've worked with big companies in all of our careers, and so much focus goes into literally branding brands into your head, right? And so you have a lot of knowledge as a human being around what's going on with companies. Is something cool? Is it on the way up? Is it not? And so using that as a hook, not a tool, but as a hook to get people into their first portfolio is what we do. Um, as I said, we're an RIA. We sit on top of a broker dealer, but we have designed a trading platform that is very simple and a lot more e-commerce-like versus the tickers and charts and graphs of most trading companies. So the secret sauce of our business and what makes us really different is this idea of investing what you know. Um, and instead of it being a who do you like, we actually go data first and we ask people if they want to, they can share their consumption history with us. So we use a data aggregation tool. People show us where they spend money. Hassani and his team built an awesome tool that converts <coughs> merchant codes on credit cards into ticker symbols. You shop at Old Navy, it comes up as the Gap. You shop at Sephora, it comes up as LVMH, which always yeah. makes people <laughs> freak out about why haven't you shopped <laughs> So, um, and again, we have a fiduciary duty for a balanced portfolio, so we work on a core satellite model. So the core is still ETFs, but the satellite are these brands and companies that people can get, you know, get some passion around. Um, our experience is very much an end-to-end -end from KYC, the New York client questionnaires, through to a balance recommendation based on your risk, through to a portfolio recommendation. We allow people to actually dig into each of the companies in a very, like we have an emoji-based stock analyzer, which is very cute. But, um, but people can also explore. And at the end of the day, they are actually self-directed investors. 
So remember, these aren't people with big piles of money. Our average client deposits about four thousand dollars. So they're people getting started, and that's you know that's how we're looking to um, to go to market. But guess what? Those people again, everyone gets older, and those boomers will one day die, and these people will be inheriting money. So they need to have this base level of skill. Um, and as I said, we're an education first. One thing that really does differentiate that we do less and sell is we built a KYC-based education platform. So I'm a middle-aged urban mom. I'm not gonna get, here's a great student loan for you. I'm gonna get, here's a good for 529 clients. So we have a very different, depending on who you are, we can take you through an educational process that's much more relevant to you. Um, here's our emojis. Google data today. Um, this is the learning portal. Um, some of the things that make us different, again, having you know a, sort of a truly personalized portfolio with things that you care about, know about, um, that are relevant to you. Uh, second, we have a lot of different use cases. So we work with some advisors around wealth transfer. Right. So yes, you're sitting with someone with a big pile of money, but guess where their kids are going to take your money when it goes to Maserati? Hopefully not. But. So the idea is to be able to set up a um, an account with the you know old school, let's say, advisor with a much more modern product. Um, and then I think the third big difference is this education first, because again, I come from a world where you try to get people to buy things all the time. And if you look at the real state of the US economy, you've got every second household in credit card distress. You know, it's easy for us in this room to say, oh, it's fine, there's a big pile of money for us to go after. But until people actually change their spending habits, like if, if setting a budget worked, we wouldn't have this problem with credit cards. <laughs> so it's, a, um, it's really a way to take people on a journey and say, it's okay, it's gonna take a while, but reframe sort of the way you relate to money from I'm going to earn it to spend it to I'm going to earn it to grow it. And that's our goal. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions from the government panel? Hi. We're going to throw it to Sunny. Sunny first. Um, should I just speak up? I'll just yeah. get up and talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Switch also on the bottom of the mic. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, thanks. Um, great presentation. Um, I guess I'll start off with two main things. One, um, as you think about um, taking your product and acquiring customers, kind of what's the customer acquisition strategy that you have? And then, uh, depending on kind of where you are, it'd be helpful to get a little bit more detail on where you are in terms of your stage of growth. And uh, how those portfolios have performed against kind of the market or uh, other portfolios to show, um, you know, how successful they I'm going to pick one of those questions. <laughs> um, so we've been in market since Q4 last year. So it's still too early to say. Depending on what month someone bought their portfolio, it's going to be depending on how they compare to the market. But. Um, but our, we've never invested heavily against customer acquisition simply because our strategy is B2B, right? We're looking to work with banks and brokers and advisors. So, but what has worked for us for our platform is having a content marketing strategy. So we have um, probably five hours of video on lynda.com, which is now LinkedIn, which, you know, if someone watches an hour and a half of the you know, basics of personal investing, like, they're a good warm lead for me. So um, yeah, it's been, Definitely content driven, and you know the B two B strategy is obviously a much different sales strategy than the customer acquisition. There was a third question. What's, what's the pricing model? So with the B two C model, it's subscription based. We pay fifty dollars a year, and then we get a bounty from the broker dealer. Um, but again, B two B, it's license. It's a license. Model. Uh, one, one kind of fundamental question uh, from Charles. Uh, when we think about kind of the question of what should I do with my money, and a lot of people turn to somebody in their lives that seems to have some knowledge as a common uh, way that people go about it, it's not often that self-directed is, is the common answer these days. ETFs are, are really overtaking uh, the world because many many active investors are not uh, generating any alpha. Um, so do you, do you think that it should just be a way um, the self-directed element of this is really critical for marketing, and ultimately you want to push people away from that, or is that always going to be a big part of it? 
Um, so we have a fairly contentious belief in that you know passive investing isn't just the only way. And a beginner investor doesn't know what alpha is. They don't know what the market is returning. And a, a statement like that actually scares them away. Like if you were to say that to a beginner, they'd be like, okay, I'm never gonna do that because it sounds terrible. So having, our whole thing is to get people started. And right, if they all they do is come in and set up a virtual portfolio, but it changes their spending habits, and it gets them to prioritize putting money into their 401k, that's still a win for us. Like we're not getting paid on AUM. So we don't actually care that much. But our goal is to get people interested and to prioritize investing over spending. And by like making that connection, that hardcore connection, so one of our data outputs is we show here's the private companies you spend money with and here's the public companies. And like I said, that you know, old navy to the gap and like that is sort of step one of education, just to actually see where your money goes. And it is kind of amazing, especially with millennials. They're very mission driven. I don't want my money to go to big oil or whoever. And then when they look at their credit card statements, it's like, oh crap, it's all the companies I say that I hate. So it's just reframing that. Um, you know, we would hope, again, with the B2B, the, the idea of having this entry level product is to be a bridge to wealth management. Right? The wealth management goal for work isn't open to anyone with less than what, a quarter of a million dollars. And is the, is the pitch to the wealth management firms that they should be using this to pitch to the older members of the family that they suggest this to, to the younger members? Or? Give it away. Okay. It's a way to open accounts. It's a way to retain assets. It's a way to you know, not have that creepy conversation, which is your dad's going to die one day, so we should be buying this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you again. You too. Um, well, I just wanted to ask, we talked more about the wealth managers, but what about the banks? You said you're reaching out to them, just what's the kind of the model with them? And just curious, I think with a lot of these educational tools, as you said, it's the education comes initially, as you said, just to get them on board. But, and again, this is not a B2C, I understand, but how do you maintain kind of the education ongoing so that there's more retention and maybe more money put, put in later along the line? So, a lot of questions. So, questions. <laughs> So with the banks, it, again, think of the two buckets of how the banks deal with their clients. You've got the retail bucket, which is car loans, mortgages, credit card fees, overdraft fees, like basically a regular bank customer pays out a lot to be a member of that bank. And then on the other side, you've got the wealth, right? So, and often in many, many banks, the two don't even talk, which is can be a challenge around just trying to sell a product that gets you from one to the other. So the goal and the model with the bank is to, it's just straight up license based on number of users. Um, it's a data set that we're selling, it's a customer journey that we're selling and it's content. And again, we have content that's gone through compliance that hasn't been touched by 17 different divisions of the bank. So it's actually pretty good. <laughs> um, so that's sort of on the, the bank side of things. Um, to get people to an ongoing basis, like we're, we're kind of obsessed with this idea of almost like subscription model. Like people are used to doing things on a micro basis, on an ongoing basis, and I know Betterman does it really well. Put in you know, $500 a month or whatever it is, and just have that recurring, um, recurring habit. Where the education comes in, it is gonna take a little bit of decoupling the product from the marketing. Because at the moment, most content is just content marketing. Right? They're trying to cross sell. You know, you give me a website and I'll draw you the org chart of who's trying to cross sell within that site. So, um, you know, the idea is to basically you know, put the habits in place and then have a steady both, you know, outreach of content, but also having it in social media. Thanks, don't do great. So apologies to anyone in the ways. I do love you. But, you, know, it's, you know, it's hard to do social media when there's so many people and so much online. Uh, so, Similar, well, I, I was going to ask a question on AUM because you said you're not really interested in AUM, but you're selling to the, to the B2B, to the, to the RIA, to the, the wealth manager. Ultimately, they're going to want to see more AUM in this account, right? So just thinking about um, your job's not done once you've sold that wealth manager, are there things that you're adding in to continue to grow that average balance from the 4000 to whatever you'd like it to be at some point in time? So, I mean, one of the biggest tools is the idea of a direct deposit. And when you're already within the bank environment, it's a lot easier to set up, you know, X amount into your savings account for an emergency fund, X amount into your growth account for the investment. And it's something that we've pushed from the beginning. This isn't a set it and forget it. This is a, even, I mean, to our own clients, we say set up a virtual portfolio and start a direct deposit. Like, it's just about that um, changing of behavior. And then over time, again, prioritizing growth over spending, and that's sort of the key, you know, the key message that's been about. Yeah, it was 
Oh, so that's zero risk. So the virtual portfolio is brand zero based with zero risk. Exactly. I love it. That's great. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, any questions? Always. So, any questions? Emmy, of course I have. Um, when you think about this, like behavioral change in any other sphere, because there's a fe like behavioral change in diet, or it's not that different, you know, we stay away from that which we fear. Have you done any kind of tracking to look at, you know, the journey of I'm a researcher, so mm -hmm. the journey of some of your customers? And data points for people who do share their spending data with yeah. us, we see even if someone puts an equity into their virtual portfolio, it has an impact on the spend within the category. Right? And if someone buys a stock within that portfolio, it definitely has an impact. So in my neighborhood, there's four different supermarkets. I buy Whole Foods as a stock. I reduce my spend in the other three. Like, that's pretty profound, pretty amazing, right? Because you want your money to come back to yourself. That's so good. Um, but one, I mean, there's so many different things that we've found. It's still too early to say that these are you know, definitive findings. Um, but to see how the relationship between debt and savings and what people are putting to growth, what we all think as rational humans, gets thrown out the door when you actually see people's statements. So we'll have someone who'll have $90,000 in their checking account, and they'll put $500 into their, into their brokerage account. Like it's, you know, and then you see other people who have crazy debt that they're paying the minimum on, and they want to do the highest risk portfolio, and you know they're putting all of their savings in. So, just that's why the education is so important because no one really tells you that as a regular human around just the sort of the fundamentals of this is how you get started. You go with who you are, and that's why we think the data is so important. Other questions? Hey. Two quick questions for you. Are you thinking about, or do you have it in the cards to leverage any user-generated content? Um, we don't. Uh, what we've found, and we have looked at it very closely with the stock tweets and the vetters, and what tends to happen is the bro dudes take over, right? It's the people who know a lot coming with all of their big fancy words and pushing their own positions or whatever they're doing. So I think it would be great to have it in a safer context amongst the community, but you know, from a general crowdsource, it's just too, I, I don't think it's worked on those platforms because it's just the same profile of people to that chain. And my second question has to do with, um, it, and maybe I just didn't hear you explain it, so bear with me, but your, um, your, your, mo your business model with licensing, did you say it was per seat, or how are you doing that with um, banks and no, banks? It's based on the number of users. So, for so example, per seat. a very big bank can cut their, their customers every which way to something. So they're gonna say, we're gonna target 20 to 32 year olds with you know more than 2,000 and less than 10,000 in their savings, like they can do that. So it's based on per seat. So yeah, so thank you, Jane. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Dan Meter. I'm from Allowance Manager, which is a web and mobile app, sort of a kid's bank. We, we put it together, that is my family and I, when my kids decided that I wasn't following through with my promise to give them the money that I thought would be beneficial for them to get to develop an understanding of money. That is experiential financial literacy. I said, I'm gonna give you some money. They said, great, but I didn't do it. The dollar values are small, my life is busy, and it, fall, it fell by the wayside, which left them with no option but to come to me and say, hey dad, may I please have some money? Which was the exact opposite behavior I was trying to inspire. I was trying to give them a pool of discretionary funds that they could manage for themselves and make their own decisions about how to spend, and then decide after the fact whether they got utility out of the purchases that they made or, or not. It wasn't really for me to make that decision. Because, you know, I can tell you for sure that the example that I mentioned earlier to some other people is if they, you know, they bought silly bands for a while and they really got some good utility out of buying silly bands. That was a great purchase for them. It wouldn't have been a great
right there just for me. And what we, what I used to do as a parent is say, look, you don't want silly bands. Well, they didn't want silly bands, you know, and it was, it was great, but I didn't want silly bands. But so anyway, I was trying to give them the ability, the autonomy and the authority to do that on their own, uh, and I failed. So my younger son at the time, my younger son, he was seven at the time, he came to me and he said, you suck at this, you're <laughs> terrible, absolutely terrible at this. Um, but you have a technical background. I worked in the Valley for 25 years as a programmer, and then I got promoted into management, which <laughs> happens. And um, so I had the skills, the rusty skills, to put together a web and a mobile app that could do this for the family. It was basically just a cash accounting system. That, and he said, why don't you just make a system that automatically credits an account to be weak? You know, the amount you said you were going to give us, so you never forget. And then when we come and we have that conversation, which is in that, which is sort of, we, we have this, in, we invariably have this conversation about like, you know, how much money do I have in my allowance? And we never agree, right? I think you have $5 and you think you have $500. We'll know the answer because we can consult the subjective system. Well, I, ran, I went home, I wrote it, showed it to Will, who's my younger son, and uh, he ran to his room and he, grabbed all the money out of his socks and piggy bank and pants and wherever he had it, ran back into the kitchen and he thrust it into my hand and he said, here, put this into allowance manager. So he basically created, he understood basic cash accounting and, and you know, banking as we use our checking account. At seven, I mean, he just sort of invented it. Uh, or, I mean, he, it, it, so, and that actually sprang out of a conversation we were having in Costco about whether I would buy him a video game or not. It was something like this, hey, Dad, we buy us a video game. He asked me and his, himself and his brother, Jack. No, I won't buy a video game. Either I was in a bad mood or I was feeling poor or I was angry or, you know, with them or whatever. But it seemed super arbitrary to them, right? They're like, wait a second, this, this is, I don't get this. I, you know, sometimes you buy his video game, sometimes you don't. Um, and so he came back, he said, he thrust it in my hand. He said, okay, so, so anyway, it worked. It worked so well and it worked so fast that we decided, I decided to share it. I had named it Allowance Manager. I just said, well, what am I going to call this thing? I need a domain name so I don't have to remember an IP address. I registered at Allowance Manager and I created under that. And then I shared it. And a couple hundred thousand people signed up to use it. Now, <clears throat> after that, of the, out of those people, um, enough people asked us, they said either, we assumed when we signed up for this, or now our kids have aged to the point where we want to do this. We thought we were going to be able to give our kids, you know, the ability to transact at real world points of sale with their own sort of modern real money banking kind of thing. So we said, that's a cool feature. We wanted to do that for ourselves. I'd love to be able to send my own kids out in the real world and have them transact at GameStop or Jamba Juice or Starbucks or wherever they happen to be hanging out with their with their friends. Again, make their own decisions about how to do it. So we said, okay, we're going to add a prepaid card to this thing, which will be a safe, low stakes environment for kids to explore their own their own spending and manage their own money. So we spent an awful lot of time working through the. Um, anybody who really has fintech experience here knows it's an incredibly heavily regulated and arduous process uh, to getting the innovative done in uh, in fintech. But um, we did it, or, and we did it really well, I think, if I can say so much myself. And, oh, two minutes? All right. So, uh, so that's basically what Allowance Manager is. And it's a very popular, very very effective, very um, simple tool that is very, that's, it's, I mean, it's very powerful. Let me tell, let me give you one more, give you a one minute story that's a, sort of a younger age group. I had an old, I had an older age group story too, but I'll, I'll tell you a story about Disneyland. So I went to Disneyland with my, with my, with my family. My Will comes up to me, same, same younger kid, comes up to me and says, I need a popcorn. And uh, my wife and I look at each other and we say, yeah, he needs a popcorn. Uh, so I take out here, so allowance managers, are, like I said, it's a web and mobile app. So I'm looking at, I say, I take out my phone and say, how much allowance do you have? Look, he's got, he's got, you know, whatever, 30 bucks or something. Actually, he had 1,500. And, um, 
<laughs> that's why you can, all, you can you, there's actually the ability to move only a little bit to the card at a time, 28 times, um, and I said, I took the, this is my wife's card, it's got a more sophisticated pattern on it than he has, he has a wave because he's a surfer, but I handed him his card, and I said, here, take this card over there, and you get yourself, you buy yourself a popcorn, this is a discretionary expense, if you need a popcorn, you go get yourself a popcorn. So he went to the popcorn vendor, and a moment later, am I done? He came back and he said, he came back empty handed, and he said to me, that guy wants $8 for a popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. And I said, yeah, it's not worth it to me either. I'm glad you made that decision for yourself. But, the, I mean, I think this is an interesting story because this, it, it, it demonstrates the value to the consumer of our product. There's a, there's a whole business side, which hopefully we'll get to when you guys ask some questions. So I've, um, consider the alternative, right? The alternative might have been, or would have been actually, the way that I behave. I would have escorted him to the vendor. I probably would have deprived him of the, the ability to social, um, the, the ability to have the social interaction with the vendor. I would have said on his behalf, He'd like a popcorn, or may he please have a popcorn? Um, the vendor would have dutifully shoveled up the popcorn, put it in the thing, and handed it to Will, who probably would have turned on his heel and walked away, leaving me to do the transaction and himself completely oblivious to the whole fact that it even existed, right? So, that, that therein lies some of the power of allowance manager in addition to the ability to move some of the money to the card and kind of do this, make the parent the bank and do some really cool stuff that way. Uh, but that's it. I think I'm out of time. And um, there you go for your attention. Thank you very much. Dustin, kick it off. Sure. Um, so I love it. Uh, I've checking out the site before. I think it's I think it's fantastic. I have a nine month old at home. I'm way too early to get this started, but I'm already planning. Right? So already, uh, how do I teach her? It's like anything in parenting, though. We think it's too early. Nine months is too early. That's way too early. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I'm gonna wait maybe twelve, maybe thirteen. Months. Yes. I'm gonna but don't be like my brother-in-law, who didn't teach his kids to swim. This is just a this is a philosophical business. <laughs> I put my kids in the pool when they were one. And they won't drown, right? Because they know how to swim. He, okay. kept, he kept this his saving and swimming. Right? <laughs> it's, it's the same thing. Cool. Um, so I, I'm sure we'll dig into kind of unit economics and acquisition and all that fun stuff. I'm the product guy, so I might do the product thing. I'm curious, what's next for you as far as like goal orientation? Uh, Five twenty nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Where do you go next for this this article? So you suggest that to you, or is that out of your own? That's pretty cool. We're doing. We're definitely. Considering 529. So, I mean, I'm not saying that you're not that smart. I, I, I get it all the time. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, but no, I'm just thinking about the like, you know, what's the arc for saving and spending is interesting, investing is interesting, long term is interesting. Absolutely. So, our couple of things. We started in the youth space because we didn't want to be perceived as a competitor to the larger banks, which are the larger financial institutions, which have a lot of power. And, uh, we'd rather be complementary than. Than competitive at this point. Our feature set is no different than anything you know that we would offer to any age group. So um, you know we can reskin it and graduate our, our users. The thing is, we can grab those users at the, at the point of when they become financial consumers, basically financial you know consumers of financial services at the very basic level, just saving and spending. And then we can add all of that. We're, we're the we're the hub. We're the nexus, right? So you can then you can layer all of this stuff, all of this stuff that we're talking about on that. So that's sort of the, the idea. 529 things, I think, is a really, a really natural addition to what we're doing. I mean, the, the process of signing up for allowance manager, as, as is true for so many of these modern fintech offerings, is very, very simple. You know, instead of spending an hour in the bank opening a new or 45 minutes in the bank opening a new account, you, 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 it's 45 seconds. It could, it could be 45 seconds to 90 seconds to open to one of these accounts. And then, you can imagine going through a couple of screens on your phone, oh, hey, do you want to open and microfund a 529 plan for your kid? Do you love your kid that much, right? Um, <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, you know, Here's the suggested amount, $50, and bang, you've got a 529 plan. Well, TIAA or... Being able to listen to their own well, right, and then the natural, the natural progression from there is that that number 
is not just sitting on, on the desk in a paper envelope every quarter, every month. Yeah. It's in front of the kid every day because he's looking at how much money he has and he's like, well, shoot, I want to, and the parent as well, shoot, I really want to contribute a little bit more to that 529. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, thank you, bro. Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, I love the idea as well. I, um, I loved it when I first heard about it, and I specifically love the idea of you're amplifying kind of what's the most, I think the next step of where FinTech is, is like the financial literacy, the social aspect is, we always think that FinTech is just about banking and making poor people rich or, you know, and I think that it's just, it's more than that. It's actually being able to educate young individuals as you're doing, which is, which is super really brilliant. So I love that. Um, so yeah, getting into kind of the numbers and stuff. So I'd love to hear how you, how you're making money and kind of, I'm, I'm hoping it's more than just the interchange piece. Yeah, no, it's and not an interchange. It's, in fact, we give all the interchange to our financial institution partner because we think it's a rounding error. Okay. We, we, we do charge a subscription because in the, in the pitch to the parent is, again, sort of like, it's, it's the same pitch that, that the prenatal vitamin makers pitch or the baby Einsteins or the, you know, do you, do you care about your kid enough to pay $50 a year? To, to ensure that you don't pass on the same bad habits to your kids that your parents pass on to you because you suck at managing money, you're terrible at managing money. So this is a really good way, the natural byproduct of simply using allowance manager is the basic financial literacy. It just it just happens because it's experiential and, it's, and, and so it's like if I want to teach my kid to ride a bike or to swim, I I put them in the pool or I give them a bike or I give them, you know, I help them with books, you know, literary literacy, but you have to have the experience. So this, so it's, fit, it's a subscription fee, then a subscription-based uh, model. There is also interchange that gets thrown off, of course. <clears throat> That's in question. Uh, we think that the natu another nat natural byproduct is the data exhaust that this thing throws off. Nobody has visibility into youth consumer behavior like we do. I mean, it's just nobody. So if you think youth consumer behavior data is valuable, your people, um, and it is. <laughs> and then, and then there's also there's also there are also some more complex things with, where you involve retailers and, and manufacturers. Where let's say there's a grandparent who calls you and says, "Hey, what is your what does an eight seven year old want for his birthday?" I don't know. What does your seven year old want for his birthday? Well, how about a wish list? Oh, he wants a basketball. Oh, well, Nike might want to sponsor a basketball. Well, he might want to come from Amazon, and so they pay a little bit. And then there's a and then the thing shows up in a virtual wrapper, sort of like your Evite does, and. Boom, there's your basketball. Do you want to claim your basketball? Do you want to redeem the cash and just get it on your allowance card and spend it elsewhere? You know, there's there are all kinds of things that, where there's a little bit of money to be made. Um, so also just last question, sorry from Augin, just um, so you mentioned that immediately you had hundreds of thousands of people sign up? Yeah, yeah, so a couple hundred thousand people. So curious just now as you've kind of been live, yeah. how many of them how many accounts opened are, I mean, can kids open an account or is it only the parents? I'm guessing. Uh, it's like, only the parents. Only the parents can do that. Yeah, I mean, we but have how many mutual, how many double accounts have you had? So many parents come in and, and they've done it for more than one child. Oh, our average is like 1.8. The, the average, it turns out, uh, the average number of kids in an American household is 1.86. And we're close to that. It's like a, a one and a half is sort of our average. Uh, so it's less than two, but it's more than one. Not bad. Uh, I think I've got the last question. So, uh, looked at you guys, looked at some of your press and media and that kind of thing. Oh, this is a really interesting idea. I don't have any kids, but uh, you know, I thought this is this is brilliant. So, did the thing that a VC does, which is punch in allowance manager comps or who else is in this space? It turns out there's a lot of other companies in this space. A, a few, not not sure, not dozens. So, I guess my question is. Um, so, so now you're in an arms race, all right? And it's a, it's a fairly... That's where you come from now. <laughs> so, so my question is, how, how are you going to beat the competitors? Is it speed? Is it offering? Is it distribution? You know, where does it, you know... Where, where oh, yeah, so, all right, so let me talk about distribution. So one of the things that we've accomplished that a lot of others have, there are two companies who have supernova by the way. There are two. There's one called Build My Parents, and there's one called Boink, uh, Virtual Piggy. Each raised $50, $60 million. I don't know really. Well, actually, I do know what they do with it because they, they were reverse shell companies. <laughs> but so, you know, that's enough said, right? But um, the the answer to that is we have maintained 
plastic payment is, is, has been vilified, rightfully. Bankers, when they realize, at some point a banker's gonna says, hey, I can thir charge 30% on a credit card, I'm gonna do it, because I have to make my numbers and I don't want to lose my job, right? So he does, and then it's, you yeah, know, that's that jerky banker, right? He's charging 30%. Same with the pro prepaid products, which have, have traditionally inhabited the, or been a service for the for the underbank. Really, you know? So there, there have been predatory behaviors associated with that. We have maintained a position way on the good side of the of the of the acting line. So good that the New York City school system has adopt, has become a customer of ours, and they're using it as a financial they're using it as an experiential financial literacy tool within the New York, New York City school system. The Girl Scouts have embraced this as a as a financial literacy school tool. They have a uh, a written curriculum, like so many. There are myriad written written curricula, right? And um, our tool overlays and dovetails perfectly into any of those, and, and allows for for uh, for the experiential component, and um, or provides the experiential component, and the and so we have distribution through youth organizations like schools and Girl Scouts and probably the YMCA coming up. And um, we also go direct to consumer, which is which we're fine tuning. Uh, and actually, our our we had a lull in our funding, so we had a little bit of a we backed off and we're doing a lot of direct to consumer stuff. Recently, we've had a little bit. We had a lot of very positive, anywhere from. 2x to 10x fluctuations in in, in immediate ROI on, on direct consumer spend, not not lifetime value of the customer, which is which was still undetermined for us, but you know immediate ROI on on, on small tests. So uh, we've time for one did, question. Did that answer answers? the question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> Yes, hello. Hi. What is the target age for your end customer, roughly? Well, the target age for our customer is the parent, really. But the, if you're talking about the, the, the parent, the, the kids, the, our, we have a, our user base is a bell-shaped curve centered really around 13 or 13 or 14, with the tails going out to 5 and 18, really. Okay. Um, How do you keep them engaged? Because I'm like thinking of my brother, who's 13 years old. Yes. None of us his phone ever and even if my mom was to suggest this is a great app you know you know you can do whatever and layer it over snapchat and all these other things that you use how do you keep them coming back and staying with the app well that's the cool thing right it's money <laughs> <laughs> i mean so i mean really it's like well how much money do i have is why why do you go to your online banking app yeah. it's not it's not that engaging bank. it's just to see how much money you have but it's it's you know when I if, if my house is on fire I'm running out with these two things this and this and I mean whatever some something that I can pay with of course of course these are well, my, my wife's ahead of me um, uh, she's left me behind these of course are converging and most of us in this room probably use probably don't carry cards or we can, you know but um, and actually I want to make a point about. I'm, I hope I, I mean that's I, 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 I sound glib when I answer that, but it's, but that's really as engaging as we get. We're not we're never going to be a Snapchat. We're never going to be a, a billboard system for uh, an app that's a billboard system. That's not our goal. And so it really is compelling though. Like, I mean, the kids who have money and allowance manager they check it every day to see what you know. I'm going to Panera. I'm going to Starbucks. I'm going to wherever. And um, but I want to point out point this out too. There was a little bit of discussion about um, Netflix earlier. Netflix never really, really wanted to be in the shipping plastic business. Right? They did it so that they could get their foot in the door and be at the nexus of distribution for digital content. We're not going to be shipping this for in the next five, ten years. I mean, people will use it for a little while longer, but this is this is a form factor that is designed so that you can make triplicate carbon copies in a zip zap machine. This is this is absurd, right? So this, we're getting our foot in the door. We want to be a household name. Everybody, we want Allowance Manager to be as as uh, as much a part of American childhood and actually global childhood as Scooby Doo or you know anything else you can think. Of. Fluffer butter. Um, <laughs> that dates me probably. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, thanks for your attention, guys. Thanks.
Um, let me get this little, little thing out of the way. Can we go? We can go. Okay, cool. So um, thanks everyone. I'm Jason Yang, the founder and CEO of Poly Portfolio. I'm actually going to start my talk here with a history lesson that uh, touches on what uh, Miklos from McKinsey, who has now left the room, um, started, started, started talking about, which is how outdated pieces of our financial infrastructure are. Um, we focus on really right where investment expertise touches wealth management. So it's relevant to a lot of the folks up here at the front, front of the um, room and everywhere else too. But the way traditionally, right, forget FinTech, but the way traditionally investment management gets distributed to the people who need investment management is actually through the mutual fund marketplace, right? Now this is a marketplace that's 90 years old, right, is regulated by, um, by, by regulation to the Investment Company Act of 1940. So regulation that's 76 years old. Um, and it's designed around the assumption that the only way you can reliably communicate with your customers is by mailing them a booklet of paper, right? Which is insane in this day and age. And so yeah, you got ETFs in 1993, that's all good, but they're still investment companies. Um, and so today,